Um, are the slides going to show up down here as well? Uh, okay. Um, I guess I'll get started. So hi, I'm Luke Valenta, and I'll be presenting Measuring Small Subgroup Attacks Against Diffy Hellman on behalf of my co-authors from the University of Pennsylvania, University of Michigan, and Adobe. To the let's give a clicker malfunction. Um, Present. Oh, okay, I see. Okay, it's working now. Okay, great. So um, these small subgroup attacks have been known about for decades, and um, the attacks are well known, and the countermeasures are written into every Diffie-Hellman standard. Uh, so we, in this study. Um, we wanted to measure uh, if hosts and implementations are actually using these countermeasures. Um, now, if you want to zone out for the rest of the talk, then I'll give you the punchline now. Nobody's implementing the countermeasures. Uh, so th this work, um, some of my co-authors and I, the ones in red here, um, when we were working on the logjam paper, we noticed some strange behavior in Diffie-Hellman implementations, and uh, we decided to investigate it a little bit further. So first, um, if you don't remember from your undergrad security class, let's, let's cover Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Um, so the, the setting is that we have um, our usual cast of characters, Alice, Bob, and Eve the eavesdropper. Alice and Bob want to negotiate a sh um, some shared secret, and um, Eve listens in on every message that they send to each other. So Alice and Bob agree on some group parameters, a prime P, and a generator G. You can think of G as being two, since that's often a good choice. And then Alice chooses a secret A and sends G to the A mod P, which will be a group element, as her public value. Similarly, Bob sends G to the B, or Bob chooses B and sends G to the B mod P as his value. Then they can each compute G to the A mod P as their shared secret, um, and from which they derive session keys and can start encrypting data to each other using the session key. Poor Eve sees all these, this communication across the middle, but has no way to determine what the session key is or decrypt the data without computing the discrete log of um, one of these values. Now, this protocol seems pretty simple, it looks easy to implement, but to quote my advisor, there are dragons swimming under the placid surface of this beautiful mathematical lake. Now, before we can get into what those dragons are, we have to, get a, we have to cover some background on groups, subgroups, and generators. So imagine a, cip a cyclic group as this circle of elements. The order of the group is the number of elements. We can choose some element G, which is a generator, um, that when we multiply it by itself, we generate every other element in the group. You can also choose some generators that only generate some of the elements in the group. This is called a subgroup. And in this case, the subgroup has order half the element, or half of the order of the full group. Uh, and finally, you need to know that there are some generators that only generate small subgroups. So in this case, uh, this generator generates a subgroup of order three. And for every factor of the order of the full group, um, there's a subgroup with that order. All right. So now let's get to the dragons. So um, whenever you're negotiating Diffie-Hellman key exchange in a group that has small subgroups, you leave the door open to the small subgroup attacks. So imagine that um, malicious Mallory, um, instead of sending her public key exchange value G to the A mod B, sends a generator of this, of this small subgroup, uh, which we call G3 here. When Bob receives this value, He's going to compute G3 to the B, um, which is going to be one of these three elements in the, in the group. When he encrypts his data with a session key derived from this shared secret, um, then Mallory can brute force over the three elements in the group to discover what B is mod three. Now, it might not seem like a big deal for Mallory to learn what B is mod three, but if she repeats this for many small subgroups, then she can eventually recover the full group, uh, or the full B using the Chinese remainder theorem. 
these small subgroup attacks are made much worse when, uh, when some conditions hold. First of all, when we're negotiating Diffie-Hellman I mean, key exchange in a group that has many, um, or where P minus one has many small factors, you know that for every factor of, of the group order P minus one, um, there's a subgroup with that order. So P minus one has many small factors, there are many small subgroups in which we can carry out this attack. Secondly, a lot of implementations um, will use short exponents since modular exponentiations are expensive. So if you reduce the exponent size um, by a factor of 10, then computing this exponentiation is 10 times as fast. Um, so what this means to an adversary is that they only need to recover one-tenth as many bits of the exponent to recover the full exponent. And another common optimization that's, that's used is, um, so some servers that are serving thousands of um, connections per second may use the same public value for, um, for multiple connections uh, as a, um, to reduce load. Um, however, if the adversary is able to learn the secret for one of these connections, then they can um, compromise all of the connections. The countermeasures to these small subgroup attacks are, are, have been known for decades, and they're written into um, every Diffie-Hellman standard. The first of which is to use a safe prime. Um, a safe prime is a prime of the form P equals two Q plus one, where Q is also prime. So in this case, P minus one only has two factors, two and Q. Um, and Q is much too large to brute force. Uh, so we only need to defend against small subgroup attacks in this um, group of order two, or this subgroup of order two. Uh, and uh, to otherwise, the adversary can learn one bit of the secret exponent. Um, and to do this, all you need to do is, is check that two is less than or equal to the public value, um, is less than or equal to P minus two. Now if you don't want to use a safe prime, um, you can also use a subgroup of large prime order Q. Um, but if you do this, then you also have to perform this additional check to make sure that the public value is in the correct subgroup. So this requires an extra exponentiation. So now, now we know about um, this attack and defenses that have been known for decades. So, so why am I up here talking about this? Um, the reason, well this can be best explained by this quote from Adam Langley in his invited talk at crypto in 2013. Um, th this quote was given in the aftermath of major TLS attacks such as crime and beast. Uh, the quote goes, the internet is vast and filled with bugs. Uh, and this is helped by Murphy's theorem, which says that anything that can go wrong will go wrong. The computer security version of this is that if it's possible for an implementation to have made a mistake, then someone on the internet has done it. Now let's look at one standard that leaves the door open for such mistakes. Um, so this, um, this NIST standard mandates that um, for, for anyone to be compliant with this standard, that they have to do Diffie-Hellman key exchange in a, um, a, a group with a short, um, sub, with a small subgroup. So you can see for um, a prime of 2048 bits, or a prime that's 2048 bits in size, um, they say to use a 224-bit subgroup. Uh, so there's, there's actually no extra performance or security benefit from using a short, a, a small subgroup when you're already using a short exponent. So there are some misconceptions about this. Um, they, it looks like they copied these um, recommendations directly from DSA, the Digital Signature Algorithm, which is a, a different algorithm from Diffie-Hellman and has different security rec uh, requirements. So now we can get to our measurements, um, the, the work that we perform um, for this paper. So we use um, fast internet scanning to scan all of the publicly visible hosts in the IP4 uh, internet, and do, we collect data on them and see, um, see what the server configurations are, what groups they support, et cetera. Um, and we pay particular attention to these RFC 5114 groups. These are groups that follow the NIST recommendations. Um, so we see that in HTTPS, SMTP, um, and the IPsec protocols, IKV1 and IKV2, 
um, there's widespread use of these groups. One thing to note about these groups is that no special attention was paid to make sure that P minus one does not have um, small factors. So there are many, many small subgroups um, with, for these standardized groups. Uh, in particular, for group 23, a small, X, or a, a small subgroup attack could recover over 200 bits of the exponent and only about two to the 42 work um, for a vulnerable um, implementation. So this is, this is quite bad. Um, and you see that SMTP um, has very wide, um, widespread support for, for this vulnerable group. So now that we see that these, these groups are widespread um, in use, it's important that people are actually implementing the countermeasures so that they're not vulnerable to the small subgroup attacks. Um, and uh, so, so we, we checked by scanning hosts and sending them malicious key exchange values to see if they'd accept them by continuing the connection with us. Um, first of all, we, we sent the value zero. Um, we didn't scan Ike for this because of some known um, problems for unpatched hosts that would cause an Ike daemon to restart. Um, however, for HTTPS and SSH, we still see a surprising number of hosts accepting zero as a public, uh, as the key exchange value, which um, the, it means they're doing absolutely no validation. Uh, we also sent the values one and P minus one uh, to see who, who would accept those. Um, now, the, the trivial check that two is less than or equal to p is less than or equal to p minus two um, would catch this. Um, but we see a, a large number of hosts that are still accepting this value, continuing the key exchange. And finally, we sent generators of these small subgroups of orders three and seven to hosts that were, um, that were serving groups that had uh, whose order um, was divisible by three or seven. And of the hosts that, um, that were serving these, these groups, almost nobody was performing validation. Um, and we were able to continue the key exchange with all of them. Now we turn our attention to TLS libraries. Um, so in, in TLS, it's actually not possible for the server to send the um, the subgroup order to the client. So the client has no hope of doing validation past, um, past the, the very simple, um, I guess two less than or equal to Y, less than or equal to P minus two. Um, however, for, for servers, they should know which groups they're, they're serving and they should know which subgroups um, to expect the client's value to be in. Um, so they should be able to do these checks. However, one, um, one vendor told us that uh, when we disclose this to them, uh, they said that the server obtains the DH parameters via a PKCS number three file, which does not contain any subgroup information. This file format is a de facto standard across all crypto libraries. So given that, um, well, for all of these TLS libraries that we examined, we didn't see anybody doing this additional validation. So this is a good ex explanation for that. Um, however, there are still a surprising number of libraries that didn't for perform even the most basic validation. Um, and you can see here what that is. Um, in fact, for OpenSSL, before we disclosed to them in January of 2016, um, they were not doing any validation and were actually, actually fulfilled all the other conditions for a full subgroup, small subgroup key recovery attack. Um, similarly, we were able to recover 17 bits of an Amazon load balancers um, instance that we set up, the, the secret value of an Amazon load balancer instance. Um, so we disclosed to them as well. Now, there are many possible reasons for this, the state of Diffie-Hellman deployments on the internet. Um, and one is, due, is possibly due to these misconceptions. So from an academic, there are many good reasons for using smaller subgroups, including efficiency and the fact that this setting matches the theoretical security analyses of crypto systems. And similarly, from a vendor, Safe primes have some undesirable, some quite undesirable properties. They don't have a subgroup with size of the selected security parameter, and that requires them to use very large keys. Um, so in fact, um, using safe primes with short exponents is just as well studied as using safe prime, or as using um, 
small subgroups with short exponents. Uh, so this is a misconception. Um, similarly, similarly, there's some disconnects between what um, academics and standards writers may think is necessary and what vendors are actually willing and able to implement. Um, so from one academic, it's a, it is only necessary to validate cryptographic par parameters properly, but this is very well known. However, um, from one major vendor that we disclosed to, um, they explained to us that uh, I bet there are TLS clients and other Diffie-Hellman users out there um, that use these values, and we would break them. Functionality trumps security every day and twice on Tuesdays. Uh, so they, they knew about these checks, but just weren't willing to implement them um, to avoid breaking some clients that might be sending the value 0, 1, or minus 1. So now for some takeaways from the talk. Um, first of all, to standards writers. Um, keep in mind that software developers may not always um, implement the checks that you uh, describe faithfully. Uh, software developers have different priorities. They may, um, they may emphasize functionality and performance over security. Um, and the fewer checks that you require of them, the more, software, more, the more secure software they'll, they'll be able to produce. Um, keep in mind Murphy's Law, that anything that can go wrong will go wrong. For software developers, uh, be careful when you use crypto primitives. Um, crypto has to be applied carefully to achieve their, um, the expected security benefits. Uh, Project Witcher Proof um, has a nice test suite for crypto libraries to, um, to test against these known attacks. Um, so you should check that out if you're a library developer. And finally, for sysadmins, if you want to check if your servers are vulnerable, then you should download our tool and, and check it out for yourself. And with that, I can take any questions. Okay.